Welcome to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's live streaming interview series, where leading new thought teachers, speakers, and authors share the intimate stories behind the 10 best spiritual books that inspired them the most on their spiritual journey. From well-known classics to hidden gems you might never have heard of, the No BS Spiritual Book Club saves you time and money by sharing reliable recommendations from those who've walked the path before you. The No BS Spiritual Book Club, the only No BS guide to the best spiritual books to inspire your own journey of self-discovery. Here's your host, founder of the No BS Spiritual Book Club, Sandy Sedgebeer. Hello and welcome. Did you know that during the war, World War II, the revered Indian philosopher, journalist, yogi, and poet Sri Aurobindo and his spiritual collaborator, known as the Mother, used subtle energy work to counter the dark, evil energies behind Hitler and the Nazis. Did you know that members of Carlos Castaneda's sorcerers group lived in a house in Mexico, which literally became magic because of all the power they had gathered together? These are just two of the fascinating facts revealed today by Wisdom Seeker, social scientist, sustainability practitioner, and self-confessed spiritual warrior in slippers, Thomas Legrand, whose spiritual journey began at the age of 23 with an encounter with native spirituality in Mexico, and went on to embrace the wisdom of a wide range of traditions and practices, including meditation, energetic healing, and Tai Chi Chuan. The author of the internationally acclaimed book, Politics of Being, Wisdom and Science for a New Development Paradigm, which puts forward a vision of an invitation to radically rethink our model of development and co-create a new development paradigm focused on being instead of having. Thomas Legrand lives with his wife and their two young daughters near Plum Village the monastery of Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh in the southwest of France, where he is the lead technical advisor for the UNDP-convened Conscious Food Systems Alliance. Thomas Legrand, welcome. Thank you very much, Sandy. Glad to be with you. So books, you said, have been such a part of your spiritual journey that at one point you had to stop reading them to be able to experience your path with a freer and lighter mind. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, I've uh, through books I've connected with uh, a lot of different teachings and traditions, and really uh, uh, being nourished uh, on my past, but also also realizing the the limitations uh, of that. So, as a uh, you know a book lover, how did that go? <laughs> uh, with books. Uh, were you able to stay away from them? Oh, yeah. I mean, a couple of months or, or just not uh, get out of spiritual books, you know, because that was uh, the point, you know, so that I don't uh, um, make my mind, you know, more full of ideas about what is spiritual past or spiritual realization and that I can rather uh, experience uh, uh you know, my own experience through a freer mind. So I probably, you know, just uh, uh, don't read uh, for a couple of months spiritual books or just, you know, read one or two, uh, you know, and took it a bit more lightly. But I I never completely, let's say, uh, uh, went away uh, from uh, spiritual books. Yeah, that's the hard one. I don't think I could do that either. So tell me how easy or how challenging was it for you to distill your book list down to just 10 titles? Uh, yes, I could have added a few ones. I felt I missed a bit. Uh, uh, there is something, I, I think it was a very interesting uh, uh, experience to bring together that list of 10 books. Uh, as I said, you know, recapitulation of uh, my life is including a spiritual practice in a, one of the traditions that I followed, you know, the. Uh, Toltec shamanic uh, past. So I took that as an interesting exercise to recapitulate my my own life and spiritual journeys through these books. 
Uh, I felt maybe there was some dimension that was missing. Maybe there, maybe because there was not like one book that would uh, represent that. Uh, probably uh, the poetry aspect, because I think that's uh, also have uh, nourished me very much. The poetry of, let's say, I could have uh, one of Tagore's book, or in Fr in France there is a, a great spiritual poet that recently died, whose name is uh, Christian Bobin. Uh, but yeah, I think it gave uh, overall a good account of you know my own spiritual journey and uh, and direction. Yeah. Were there any surprises there? I mean, did you you know stumble across a, an aha, an inspiration of some kind, something that you hadn't noticed when you were living through it? Yeah, I did. Uh, I did reread. I think uh, yeah, two or three books of that list, uh, small ones. Um, uh, I did reread, you know, the first one, uh, Journey to the East by Aman S., which was the one I started my list with and the book I read when I was 16 years old. Um, one of the surprises probably also is because the last book uh, was a Sufi book and based on a recent encounter that was uh, impacting for me. And I noticed uh, in that selection I had three Sufi Islamic book, which was, you know, a uh, rather strong part that are uh, stronger than I would have sought, uh, let's say, in my own journey. Um, but, and it did really, uh, you know, connected me very much with uh, how my spiritual journey started, which is uh, in Mexico with the path of the spiritual warrior and uh, the book of Carlos Castaneda, for example. Yeah, and that is the first book on your list, The Art of Dreaming, which you say you read um, when you were about 16? Uh, well, the one I read when I was 16 was The Journey to the East, which is the first ah, book. Ah, Journey to the East. Uh, the first book on my list. And uh, yeah, I think... Absolutely, uh, you're absolutely correct. Yeah, it, I was a bit young for the spiritual warrior thing, probably. Uh, but this uh, Journey to the East, it was, you know, like... Um, enigmatic symbolic description of someone in, in, a, in the on the path of some kind of secret brotherhood that was connecting a lot of you know important names in the history of humanity and i was really wondering what it mean you know and what was that because it was all symbolic and it was not clearly put maybe expressed that this was a spiritual path etc and for me as a young person it looked a little bit uh uh, I was staying with that question, you know, what does that mean and, and how is that path? So I think that was the first, uh, you know, kind of connection somehow to my soul through books with this question. You know, there is something there that uh, I, I relate to, but I'm not sure exactly what it is. So why did you read that book? Did somebody suggest it to you? Good question. I don't even remember. I don't know where how I got this book. I think I read others then from uh, Herman S. But it was probably the first one I read from him, and I, I I don't I can't remember how it crossed my path. Yeah. Hess has said that it was uh, destiny that gave me that fabulous adventure. Do you believe in destiny? Yes, definitely. I think uh, I think there are definitely some things on the um, that we find on our path because you know our soul requires it, and I even think maybe uh, a lot of things that our soul already knows probably materialize uh, easier than some other things that our soul doesn't not know. No, so I think there is uh, a kind of probably a kind of a, of a right, a sort of right to be able to reconnect what is already part of us and that materialize in, in our life. Yeah, I do think mm, so. Yeah, I think that books, um, a lot of books are actually reminders and we don't realize that until after we've read them, but there's a, a familiarity about some of the concepts that they contain. Yes, definitely. And I, you know, for some people, they read a book and, they don't understand much or it just don't stay with them. And I, I feel like when I was, you know, telling you I was reading at some point, especially when my when I started my spiritual path in my 20s and early 30s, I was especially 20s. I was reading a lot of books uh, before I, I decided to to read less. And uh, it was a lot of kind of download of, you know, somehow remembering just things that I know already from inside. And 
Yeah. And maybe that's why, you know, you read a book and somehow everything is clear, simple, you fully integrate it from the beginning. Some other people read the same book and they don't remember anything, no? Mm. So book two on your list is The Art of Dreaming by Carlos Castaneda, which was published in 1993. Tell us the story behind that book and how it impacted you. So that's an interesting story. Uh, indeed, I was a student in a, in a master's degree in Paris, and uh, I was about to go on a student exchange for six months in Mexico. And I had a, a teacher in some course who was very uh, special teacher, you know, the kind of teacher that tell you, you know, you're free here to talk about your last uh, drug experience. Uh, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, political science school, so very special. And, uh, and at some point he mentioned, you know, he said, uh, yeah, I was on initiative uh, journey in Latin America. We were reading Carlos Castaneda's book. And, you know, I've never heard about Carlos Castaneda, but once I, at the same time, more or less, I was maybe a few days or weeks after, I was sitting in the, in the metro in Paris, and in front of me, there was someone reading a Carlos Castaneda's book, and it, it was called The Art of Dreaming, which I found was an interesting uh, title. So I bought that book because I remember the name he said from Carlos Castaneda and I was living to Mexico. It was probably, you know, two, three weeks before I was uh, going to Mexico. So I bought this book uh, and when I arrived in Mexico, I started to read it and I found out, wow, that's the most, that's the craziest book I've ever heard, you know, in terms of description of what they do with dreams in subtle realms, they're exploring a the whole huge realities and they are telling it you know with very details as it's as if it was true you know really it's very detailed so uh and uh funny enough you know a couple of months after reading that book i did connect with some uh chamans in mexico which really changed my life i was about to really uh recognize a spiritual past and recognize that was what i was looking for and this group of chamans was really uh, using the teachings of Carlos Castaneda, what we call in Mexico the, the Toltec teachings. And uh, so, you know, a couple of months after saying, you know, wow, this is the craziest stuff I've ever read about, I was uh, with that group, which uh, maybe not uh, doing, you know, uh, as deep, you know, as uh, the, the, the kind of journeys uh, Carlos Castaneda describes. But yeah, did some, uh, you know, using the same concept, the same uh, and the same kind of work. Yeah. yeah, he talks in The Art of Dreaming about four dreaming doors. Tell me about those four doors. Sure. Uh, so the idea is, that, and, you know, there is a, there is a movie that I feel builds, uh, they don't quote Carlos Castaneda, but it's very much a little bit like that, you know, uh, Inception. So uh -huh. for those that have already uh, watched this movie, so the doors are basically dreaming. Uh, dreaming, let's say, um, some people know about, um, how do you say? Um, lucid dreaming? Lucid dream, yeah. The difference with what they call dreaming is that in dreaming, you become aware of your dream body. And that allows you uh, you know, if you're lucid, you're kind of, you know, almost like in a, you're kind of watching it, you know, like a, like a movie. But if you're mobilizing your uh, dream body, then you're into the movie and you can decide to fly. You can decide to do all these wonderful things that the dream body can do. And uh, so that is basically going through the first um, uh, door of dreaming, you know, becoming, be able to awake within your uh, dream body in your dreams, right? And uh, I've asked, you know, my uh, teacher, Shaman in Mexico, say my first teacher, how to do that. And he said, you know, the, the, um, the main issue is to gather as much energy as you can and all this intention. And when you have enough energy with that intention, it will uh, materialize. And it did uh, eventually just... Uh, I think a few weeks after I went back from Mexico to, um, to France. Uh, but the second door of dreaming is uh, basically awakening within a dream, within a dream, right? So oh, yes. you are with your dream body in your, uh, in your conscious dream and you decide to lay down, for example, 
and maybe close the eyes and at some point go into another dream where eventually you'll be able to wake up again. Uh, this has happened to me uh, a few years after, uh, no, uh, let's say, yeah, yeah, not so long. Yeah, a few years after, as I will, or oh, yeah, five or 10 years after, let's say, rather 10 years after, uh, as I was doing a lot of Qigong and Tai Chi Chuan, so energetic practices and, you know, gathering a lot of energy, being also really in that flow of letting go what needs to what needs to happen uh, once it happened to me. And uh, in Castaneda, they say there are four <laughs> doors like that. You, you can go in ever more subtle uh, realities through this act of waking up in your dream body in dreams. Wow. Have you gone through the other four, the other two? No, 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 no. No, no. okay. <laughs> Not that. You, one thing I have to say about your list mm -hmm. is that uh, you're really challenging my ability to pronounce some of these names. Um, book number three is The Sorcerer's Crossing, A Woman's Journey by anthropologist Taisha Abelard. Taisha Abelard, yeah. Ah, okay. Published in 1992, Woman's Journey. Tell us what attracted you to this book. Uh, I think that was very interesting to me. Uh, it's the account of how this Taisha Abelard uh, was even started to be identified and even recruited by this kind of esoteric group of Carlos Castaneda. So um, I think someone saw her in a party. She was like quite crazy. You could see, um, I don't know, dancing, maybe putting herself naked or something. So, and they could recognize she had a lot of energy. She couldn't even control it. So at some point they make uh, even a, a, a trick to attract her uh in uh to come uh in the place where the group lives somehow so even you know they say that these kind of warrior uh, sometimes they can't you know you can't um sometimes you have to use trick to bring them into the group basically and then she's uh she comes to that house she's uh having some teachings and inductions and she's starting her spiritual journey and uh, what I found really interesting is um, because it gives a great account of a reality of, uh, you know, these Toltec teachings is that they are bringing together a group of, I think it was 14 people, if I remember well. And the group have at each generation, the really, uh, everyone in this group has a specific function and they all have specific characteristics that, uh, you know, uh, the leader of that group can recognize and be able to identify these people. And then they work together to gather their energy and make things possible that are, you know, possible by when you are 14, that you are not one. Uh, my own teacher uh, explained to me, you know, he, I remember he said to me, uh, if you're in a jail and you want to uh, escape, you'd rather uh, do that as a group rather than an, as an individual. You can you know, you can do more things together. Okay. So, yeah. and uh, so I think that's, you know, how to uh, live together as a group in this house. And as you said at the beginning, uh, there is even a moment where she could go into self-pity or something because it's too difficult for her, etc. And her teacher tells us, wait, if you're going that way, you won't be able to come back again in this house because the energy of this house will simply reject you. So there is this, uh, you know, the, the spiritual warrior path in that tradition is not uh, much about self-pity or even so much even about, um, they say even, you know, compassion is not necessarily helpful to even to others. So uh, it has a very, uh, that kind of warrior energy and uh, it's very well reflected. And, and she goes through uh, experience such as gathering her energy to be able to cross a wall, for example, you know, let's say. Uh, this kind of thing, which makes, you know, can tell the house is, uh, you know, pretty, pretty special. Uh, you can imagine the other aspect of it, which I sometimes I recommend that book is for women uh, because it gives a great account of what is a, a woman journey, especially on that path of spiritual warrior and what a woman has to um, undergo and heal and let go to become that kind of spiritual uh, warrior. So I think that's also a great resource for, for women.
Mm. Well, that book um, is actually available for donation on the website archive.org. So if you can't find it on Amazon or the usual places, go to archive.org and you can probably download a copy there for just a, a few dollars. So book number four um, is only available in French. And my question, you know, is why are you why are you recommending this book to an English speaking audience, predominantly English speaking, if it's not available in the language? Sure. So I, I keep it uh, included because I felt, you know, the exercise for me was to recap my own journey. And I felt uh, these uh, teachings were important for me. It's a book by uh, Vladi Stefanovic, who founded the uh, Art of Qi School. So that's a Tai Chi Chuan, Qi Kong uh, school that he, he founded and in which I've been practicing with for, um, I guess, 15 years. And, uh, and it's a great continuation of, uh, as I went back, you know, I, I stayed, uh, I spent three years in Mexico um, learning from this shaman and the spiritual warrior's past for me has been very uh, important. And I can uh, notice that I'm, uh, my soul is very much that of a, of a warrior. And um, I think I tell in the, somewhere in the list, I said, even before I went to Mexico, uh, I remember being in a live concert of, uh, of an electronic music band who were famous, the Chemical Brothers. In, that was in Paris, probably around 2000s or something. And, uh, and it was, they said it was the best concert they ever did. And I remember after like 30 minutes, the concert has ended, people were still dancing. You know? And uh, at some point I said to a friend, you know, this is a warrior thing. And I don't know, he said later to me, there was something in my energy that you reminded when I said that, that was, that really came alive. So that is a kind of, um, you know, um, thing that um, has told me and really that spiritual warrior archetype was really the basis for me to, to wake up when I was 23 in Mexico and, and start my spiritual journey. And I needed really this uh, willpower energy to start transforming myself. Uh, so, and when I went back to Mexico, I, uh, I found this Tai Chi Chuan school, which was, uh, really amazing. And, uh, Vladi Stefanovic, uh, was really a warrior also himself. I mean, he was initiated by a great master when he was 15. And I think that was probably 1940 in, uh, ex Yugoslavia. And, um, he's basically telling a lot of accounts of how he, he, he was a resistant against the Nazi, so he was always risking his life. And there's a lot of stories about how this, uh, what he calls, you know, or, um, or willpower, basically, and the will to live, which is uh, most powerful Lee, can really truly make a miracle. So he, he, he gives a lot of stories about how things materialize, how he got the right intuition, how, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, because he was so connected to that inner center from which uh, we call it the Tang Tian in, um, yeah. in Ara, in uh, Tai Chi Chuan and Qigong. Mm. So tell us the title of that book in French and what it translates to in English. Yes, yeah, so the title is uh, Médecin devenait guérisseur, which would translate, I guess, in English by Doctors May You Become Healers, because it was a a healer himself and um yeah so he was really using that kind of powers that comes from you know direct connection to almost inner center and yeah that's where the his his teacher when he said you know he knows that he would be risking his life as a resistant it said he just gave him an advice you know when you need just go back to your center and that's from this center the tang tian or ara that's what saved his life uh, many times. Mm. So book number five is The Synthesis of Yoga by Sri Aurobindo. This was published in 1948, and you discovered his work when you were on a trip to India in, what, 2010? Uh, yes, in 2010, yeah. I was doing uh, some consulting work in India, which led me to travel, and at some point I was in, uh, in Chennai or Madras, and uh, someone uh, said I should go to Pondicherry, to, it was a French-speaking colony at some point, etc. 
And, uh, and you know, even uh, funny enough, I remember the last moment wondering if I should cancel it because it was a bit too far and I was very tired, etc. And And I have seen that on my journey that each time I'm about to make a big step, uh sometimes there is something that says maybe you should not go or <laughs> uh so i remember that and uh, yes i went to uh pondicherry and discover uh the teachings of shri orobindo and um and his companion the mother uh going to their ashram in pondicherry and also going to oroville which is uh, the community the mother um uh, created next to uh, pondicherry and I did really uh, find the teaching that feel, I would say, closer to my soul. And, um, and these are, and somehow it reflects also my past in terms of embracing a lot of different things. Uh, the teachings of Sri being uh, known about uh, as integral yoga. And this book is a synthesis of yoga uh, in which give a, a really fascinating account of all the i would say the different sides of the spiritual journey and in india we, they named them as a spiritual path and named them as yoga so it goes into uh the, uh, the yoga uh, of service which is uh the um, uh sorry i'm uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm forgetting the name it will come back uh and then the um, the, the karma yoga of course uh, then the yoga of knowledge, the Jan Jnana yoga, uh, the yoga of devotion, of divine love, the Bhakti yoga. Uh, it goes a bit quick on the, on Raja yoga, yoga of the mind, and Atta yoga, yoga of the body. But it's, uh, you know, these are universal uh, aspects of the spiritual journey. He use uh, the Hindu tradition, the Hindu concepts, but and he gives... Um, a fascinating account of you know all these dimensions of spirituality basically it's a universal spirituality in all these different facets and what it means uh for someone to experience it uh at a you know psychological level energetic level spiritual level etc so you really uh he's telling you his whole experience of uncovering all these different aspects of spiritual development so that's it's a big book uh, it's even uh, uh, i wrote it in three different books uh, you have three uh, volumes uh it's quite dense uh, so sometimes you know if you're tired you may feel no i don't understand anything uh, sometimes when you are in it very concentrated you just feel wow this amazing so so much richness in every in every sentence and he and shiro bindo were uh, really uh writes like shakespeare so uh, basically for him he's a poet and he said, basically, I do poetry by, uh, he's taking a vibration, as he said, and he's just converting it into words and sentences. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we're going to come back to Sri Aurobindo and what he and the mother did during the war, which uh, is absolutely fascinating. Um, but we'll talk about that after the break. You're listening to the No BS Spiritual Book Club interview and sharing the 10 books that had the biggest influence on his life journey is Wisdom Keeper, Social Scientist, Sustainability Practitioner and author of the internationally acclaimed book, Politics of Being, Wisdom and Science for a New Development Paradigm, Thomas Legrand. We'll be back with more from Thomas after this break. Om Times TV. Maya Angelou once said that there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and when I'm not hosting Om Times Media's flagship radio show, What Is Going On, and the No BS Spiritual Book Club, I help people share their untold stories. Books are my life, my joy, and my passion. And there is no greater reward than helping aspiring writers get their books out of their heads and into the hands of those who are waiting to read them. If you feel that you have a book in you, but don't know where to begin, visit sedgebeer.com, click on the Work With Me tab and find out how my experience helping others tell their stories might be just what you've been looking for. That's sedgebeer.com, S-E-D-G-B-E-E-R.com. 
Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust, spheric approach. Own Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Own Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Own Times magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times, open yourself to the possibilities. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Welcome back. Thomas Legrand, book number six, another uh, interesting title, A Spirit of Tolerance, The Inspiring Life of Tierno Bokar by Amadou Hampati Bar. I hope I pronounced that reasonably well. Um, that book was published in 1980, and you said that this was a book that you found incredibly moving. Indeed. Um... I've, I've worked and lived uh, in Africa. You know, at some point, I was uh, working with the African Development Bank based in Tunis and um, engaged in different um, projects, especially in West Africa. And uh, I've very much connected with uh, the traditional African wisdom. And Amadou Ampateba is, you know, probably is a very famous reference for that, especially in West Africa. Um, students are studying uh, his books uh, in high school and so he's a, he's a very well-known reference, he, he's a very interesting character, he was, um, uh, he was part of the, of the colonial public administration uh, at his time at the, um, yeah, in the early 20th century we could say and he, as he was going from uh, an assignment position to the other he was already always collecting the oral stories of this place. So he became uh, an important anthropological uh, reference for all these uh, ancient oral stories. And uh, in this book, he is giving the, um, the, uh, an account of the life and teaching of uh, a saint, a Sufi saint uh, who was living in, in Mali uh, in the early 20th uh, century. Uh, and he eventually became, I think, the successor of this saint in his lineage. So he was also deep into his uh, spiritual Sufi teachings. And um, yeah, I mean, to me, I, I think it's very also um, this experience of being able to relate to this kind of people, whatever, in very different contexts, you know, both geographical historical and being touched by you know their words their practice etc it makes me feel really connected to a whole uh, uh, line of of people that are trying finally you know in in many different contexts they are bringing the same light so it it, it really makes me feel connected to these uh, to these different um, people and uh, and I feel personally touch very much by, um, I think Mali is an important uh, cultural and spiritual center in, um, in Africa and, and the world. And um, yeah, there are some, not in this book, but in another one, uh, I, I think maybe a little bit in this one, not, not so much, but I've also been very much uh, interested by the what they call the, um, the hunters. So the hunters have uh, a deep spiritual uh, significations. They are, you know, there's a 
a ritual, I think, to become a traditional enter, hunter in West Africa. Uh, so you're part of a, it's kind of a, uh, a congregation or an esoteric group, you could say. And uh, they know how to read the signs of the forest, for example, of nature, etc. Uh, when I was, I went once to Bamako in Mali and uh, I've learned a little bit about that. And there was, I think they gather in Bamako every 50 years or so, and it happened. Uh, you know, when I was aware somehow of, the, of that or just before. Uh, so it was quite present for me. And I'm, once I was about to leave even in Mali, uh, I, I had a, an offer, um, a professional offer to leave there, uh, which I did not accept because also those, the country was starting to be war. But I remember even in dreams going there and um, and yeah i mean that's another story but there's some uh, uh thing that makes me think that um there was a connection there is a connection with someone that is living there or uh i'm not sure if he's still living or not but uh, because of some of my some of the dreams important dreams my wife has done where she had when she was 11 years old she was received into a council and there was a person which we believe is someone from mali that was receiving her and the fact is that 30 years later, we didn't meet someone she saw on that dream when she, 30 years before, which had the same kind of dream. And she, and she came in, in Plum Village to announce that she wanted to form a council, a sacred earth council. And my wife was able to recognize her as someone she saw on a, on a dream 30 years before. So, which makes us think, you know, all these people, and we even met another people she saw in that dream. And so I think uh, for, uh, there was another one that is from Mali, from the Dogon, we believe. And I feel I've, you know, somehow been called by that connection. Mm. Yeah. Yes, it's interesting how these things happen. Yeah, we talked about destiny earlier, and there are some things that you know you couldn't you couldn't arrange. Um, mm. You know, only fate can arrange them for you. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So book number seven, Al Sira by Mahmoud, Mahmoud Hussein, uh, two volumes and published in 2005. So that's, uh, you know, in Islam, you have the Quran, uh, you have, uh, which is, you know, words that the prophet has received. There is a hadith, which what uh, are uh, what uh, the Prophet Muhammad has uh, said, sayings, and Al Sira are more the story of the the Prophet. And in this book, I guess they are, you know, uh, there are different interpretations. There are different ways to put them together. But he is a is a famous, I think, um, Islamic scholar, and he decided to put them together in that story of Al Sira. And it's really the same, you know, we. I was I was reading it when I was living in Tunisia, and um, so that was you know more I was in the right context, and I could feel completely transported to uh, Arabia in the eighth century, seventh century, right? With a, and you have all these historical anthropological aspects, you know the even to start with before you know there is always and you can imagine there is always some prophecy. People are expecting someone to come. There is always one person that would like to be the prophet, but he's not. And you know all these kind of small details that you have as a story, and and you can see even you know the you can really feel a human being basically recognizing that he's somehow being sent on earth uh, by God and going through his transformation. And for him, it could it may have been completely completely crazy. And, and then, you know, to understand uh, what was his message in, in this historical, geographical uh, context. And, you know, we tend to see often look at religion. Now they are being siloed now. But when you, when you um, read, you know, that story, he, I remember there's an account where he's being served by a, a Christian slave and he's asking, so you are Christian? And... Uh, and the slave is surprised. So, you know, the Christian said, yeah, Jesus is sent by God like me. He's a, he's a friend, he's a brother. You know? And so that gives a completely different uh, views on what is this message uh, not needed to be, you know, uh, then we put, uh, we put that in a box that we call uh, Islam or we call 
Christianity, etc. But when you read the lives of you know these uh, prophets, you have a, a much more universal account uh, of you know what has been uh, their role and function. And uh, makes me think also about the Baha'i prophets, where I, I loved also uh, reading their stories. They're all uh, very inspiring. Mm, yeah. And someone who, of course, is still inspiring millions of people around the world, Thich Nhat Hanh, who is the author of your eighth book, Love Letters to the Earth, um, published in 2013, I believe. And you said this is your favorite book by him. Indeed. And you were talking about destiny. Well, I think, you know, um, the way we came now, we, I live next to uh, Plum Village, the monastery of Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh, where I used to live. Uh, we arrived with my wife eight years ago, but the, the story is that the first day I met my wife in Costa Rica a few years before, in 2009, as I was coming from France, she said, there is a place I like to live, which is called Plum Village. And so the first day we met, and then she rented me a room, and the first day we met, we lived together. <laughs> so that's a funny story. And in 2014, as, I, as we were coming to Plum Village for a retreat, uh i remember on the way driving to towards plum village i remember feeling the calling and uh later on i realized that three weeks before i had written in my diary that i could feel also that calling you no know? and uh, we arrived there it was a friday evening and on sunday morning where there was a gathering of the different hamlets coming together uh and we had Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, which I think was really at his best, uh, and uh, with this important chant in our tradition of on the Buddha of Compassion, Avalokiteshvara, uh, which is very famous. And, you know, just uh, realize that day that maybe, uh, because then we have talking circles on the afternoon that, uh, you know, probably a, a third of the people or half of the people cried, you know, during that chant because of all the, and I could sense that energy during that you know, and Sunday morning, and I said, wow, there is uh, something that is going on here. We are in a, in a remote uh, um, area of France, but there's something really uh, happening here. And uh, I think uh, maybe we want to be part of that. And uh, we, um, we came back two months after. Tignatan was already sick. It was just before he did his, uh, he did his stroke. And he was sick, and we said, well, it's here and it's now. And four months after, we, we started living here. So I really felt, um, you know, something arranged by destiny. Yes. And, um, and somehow I choose also this book. It's, it's a beautiful book, Love Letters to the Earth. Uh, I think we've lost your sound, Thomas. Oh, that's strange. Uh, I didn't hear what you said yeah. then. Is it back? Yes. Okay, yes. Good. Okay. So, um, uh, what I was on, uh, yeah, um, it really feels like uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, to me, turns Buddhism into uh, a native, almost, I would say, uh, tradition. So I can feel the same respect, belonging, love for the earth that I could feel in uh, native spirituality. Uh, and it reminds me very much, you know, I feel there's a lot of parallel between Thich Nhat Hanh and someone like San Francisco of Assisi. Uh, the simplicity, uh, the, emphasis, the emphasis on nature, on the community, on is also, you know, we are chanting very, uh, almost childish, childish uh, joyful songs, which uh, I've seen uh, San Francisco of Assisi was also uh, doing. And uh, yeah, love letters to the earth. I mean, I work uh, for the earth. I've studied my past on, um, from native spirituality. So this is a, a beautiful book that shows our interbeing with, with Mother Earth uh, that I very much recommend. Mm -hmm. And maybe I can add, because I had to choose only one book, and, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh is my most important teacher. Uh, and really, he helped me also. I think I, I said I found in his teaching the medicine for my soul, because I needed, coming from this path of the spiritual warrior, 
I think I needed more joy and more ease, which are at the, the center of Thich Nhat Hanh's teaching. And I, I think I tell the story in that list about once I was in the bookshop in Plum Village um, at the beginning of, of the time I was there, and someone, um, somehow my eye was about to grasp uh, a sentence on a book as someone was moving with a book. And it says, if you make your past a struggle, then it's not your past. So uh, my, uh, and I think because my, as a soul, I'm very much connected to this spiritual warrior archetype. I also uh, come to realize I also have the disbalance that come with it. And I'm probably, I would think, at a stage in my own spiritual journey where uh, this is um, important for me to transform that warrior energy and bring more ease and, uh, and enjoyment, uh, which uh, Thich Nhat Hanh has uh, helped me to. Hence the warrior in slippers. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Because that's I, 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 I was wondering how to qualify that because I still feel very much connected uh, I, I, to that warrior energy, which is part of me. But, you know, I have two kids. I work. Uh, I, uh, I, I'm not, you know, as I thought, maybe maybe at some point I thought I would be, you know, working on me with a group and being a you know, single uh, person just focusing on that. Uh, you know, uh, that work of the spiritual warrior with a group of people. And it's not, uh, it's not my life right now, but it's, I still retain something of that energy and that wisdom from, uh, but from a different aspect. So it says uh, spiritual warrior and sleepers. Yes. Mm. So book number nine, The Light That Shone Into the Dark Abyss by Maggi Litchi Grassi or some people would call it Maggie, I'm not sure, um, depends where you live. That was published in 1994. It is out of print, but I have seen that you can get it as a used book on Amazon. Um, and we have probably less, about eight minutes left. So um, we're going to have to move fairly quickly through this one um, and the next one so that we can talk about your book. But this is the book in which... Uh, the revelations about Sri Aurobindo's secret war against Hitler. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, just very quickly, and people can check more information. Um, I mean, Sri Aurobindo uh, spent the last 25 years of his life in his own room, and he was basically working on subtle energies. I think he was trying to evolve uh, the mold of the human body so that as a species, we could evolve into a different type of being. And uh, they were, they saw, uh, basically, they were working on uh, Earth, humanity's evolution. And they are, you know, they are saying we are in a big transition for that. And they saw war, basically, as in the Nazis, basically, as manipulated by dark energies. And they did uh, work a lot from distance with their, also with their subtle bodies on that. So, you know, like supporting even soldiers on the field, there is some testimonies about that. Or, um, you know, the mother said to Maggie that uh, each day uh, she was um, talking with Shobindo that was reading her the words he tried to put in Churchill's mouth. And then they were listening to the BBC and they were hearing more or less the same kind of words. And we know, you know, Churchill is a unique experience in history or he has been able to, um, you know, um, bring all his country against the Nazi and and really make um, you know, uh, an important, um, um, yeah, play a very important role in the Nazi's defeat. So I, I don't say much more. I invite people to, to check, but that's very fasc fascinating, uh, this kind of work. It certainly sounds like a fascinating book, and I'd like to get hold of a copy of that and read it myself. So book 10, A Journey Through 10,000 Veils, The Alchemy of Transformation on the Sufi Path by Sheikha Mari, Mariam Kabir, 2008. Exactly. So that's the last book I've read. and uh, But I I met, I met uh, Sheikha at the Parliament of the World Religion in August in Chicago. And it was very funny because I see that very as a typical kind of spiritual uh, meeting with Sufi teacher, the kind you find in stories. So basically, uh, she was having a booth where she was selling some um, 
closes and uh, my wife was there and I saw a pile of book. I look at the book and and I look at it and then I ask her, this is your book. And as she answered me, I saw her eyes and I saw such a light in her eye and, you know, so many things I saw in that, uh, in that side that, uh, and I said something like, well, uh, then I know it's a good book, you know, from what I can see in your eyes, right? And we started to connect like that. We exchange uh, books. And I think she really mirrored me what I was uh, looking for uh, at that stage in my own evolution, uh, which is really being connected with that joy and love of just being in touch with the divine, uh, which she uh, embodies very well. And this book is about a whole story um, starting as a young EP, even in California, and then traveling the world, just being guided by voices she was hearing, and and then going through very deep, um, 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 how do you say, um, teachings with uh, Sufi uh, Sufi masters. So um, so trainings, I would say, yeah, Sufi trainings. So yeah, definitely looks like the last uh, important read on, on my journey and, and encounter on my journey. Mm. Well, that's your 10 books. Um, tell me about your own book, Politics of Being, Wisdom and Science for a New Development Paradigm. What was the inspiration for that? I think the inspiration, I mean, from that moment, my spiritual journey started, let's say, in Mexico in 2000. To, uh, there was this Mayan prophecy in that time, no? in Mexico, the first time I heard about it, about a change of consciousness in, in 2012. And so that was, you know, really at the beginning of my spiritual journey. And um, some, somehow I've always been interested by how spiritual teachings can shed light on the happenings of the world and what we are going through as humanity at the moment, which I think is by basically being called to do that spiritual, cultural transition, a change of consciousness. Um, I was drawn then to the teachings of Sri Aurobindo that I've told about the spiritual evolution of humanity, etc. And to me, that has all, you know, increasingly were the right lens through which to see, to interpret what was happening in the world. But, uh, but funny enough, nobody talks about that much in the media, in the academia, in politics. And uh, also, as I was working with UN agencies on environment, forest conservation, climate change, etc., I really came to the conclusion that there's little uh, we can achieve uh, until we really change the priorities of our lives. So this is happening for many of us at the individual level, but it also needs to happen at the collective level. And so in this book, I propose, you know, I was basically my main question was, is what is a spiritual approach to politics or let's say development, sustainable development. And um, I found this center it's in the Earth Charter, let's say when basic needs have been met, human development is primarily about being more rather than having more. And I found out nobody uh, defines what being more means in theory or in practice. And I thought I, will, I felt called to write a collective book where I would give the framing of, you know, that new development paradigm of the politics of being and specialists from different spiritual tradition and different uh, sectors would write what does that mean according to their own experience traditions etc but i was not able to bring them together into that book so at some point i said well then i will need to write it myself so this has been a 10-year journey for me to to write this book uh, and uh, it, the book has been launched uh, on january 22nd 2022 which was the day uh, my teacher uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, the master Thich Nhat Hanh passed away. And, um, and it has been really uh, recognized as a breakthrough in the conversation of how we can bring that kind of spiritual co co conversation uh, or vision into a mainstream political sustainability uh, conversation, bringing the spiritual teachings from all the uh, different traditions, but also the science uh, because we know have a science of, let's say, you know, happiness, empathy, compassion, peace. We know, you know, how to understand better how the life organizes itself and we should organize ourselves in harmony with that. Um, systemic thinking, 
uh, all the science on mindfulness and the effects of meditation, etc. So basically, basically, these are the building blocks uh, from um, these values, and uh, that they are field of scientific research. They are also at the core of many social change initiatives. And based on that, we can have a whole very concrete policy agenda in many different sectors. Uh, I have nine sectors, nine chapters on, on sectoral chapters in the book uh, to have a very concrete, tangible policy agenda, mainly based on existing, almost exclusively based on existing examples. So it's both a very deep vision, very transformative, and it's also very concrete and feasible. And let's hope enough politicians read it. Indeed. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm sorry that we're out of time. Um, I will let everybody know that you and I will be doing an interview in the new year about the book, and we will be focusing completely on that. So uh, if you want to know more, stay tuned, and we'll let you know when that's upcoming. And um, we'll have time. You can really go into the subject then. Um, Thomas, thank you so much for sharing your 10 best spiritual books with us and uh, for joining us today. Thank you, Sandy. That was a great opportunity. I, I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Me too. So Thomas Legrand's 10 best list can be found at the nobsspiritualbookclub.com and you can learn more about his book, Politics of Being, Wisdom and Science for a New Development Paradigm at politicsofbeing.com. And also about Conscious Food Systems Alliance, which he's very much involved with at undp.org. That's it for this week. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and I'll be back at the same time next week with another 10 Best interview for the new BS Spiritual Book Club. Till then, it's goodbye from me, and thank you again to Thomas Legrand. Thank you, Sandy.